The Professor Was a Thief by L. Ron Hubbard. No one knew why he was called a pop unless it was that he had sired the newspaper business. For the first few hundred years, it appeared, he had been a senior reporter going calmly about his business of reporting wholesale disaster. But during the past month, something truly devastating had occurred. Long overdue for the job of city editor, lately vacated via The Undertaker, Pop had been demoted instead of promoted. Ordinarily, Pop was not a bitter man, but there were limits. When Leonard Colborn, whose diapers Pop had changed, had been elevated to city editor over Pop's decaying head, Pop chose to attempt the dissolution of Gaul in the manufactures of Kentucky. But even the latter has a habit of wearing away and leaving the former friend a mortal enemy. Thus it was when the copy boy came for him that Pop swore at the distilleries as he arose and looked about on the floor where he supposed his head must have rolled. Mr. Colborn said he ought to see her right away. Pop limped toward the office, filled with resentment. Leonard Colborn was a wise young man. Even though he had no real knowledge of the newspaper business, people still insisted he was wise. Hadn't he married the publisher's daughter? And if the paper didn't make as much as it should, didn't the publisher have plenty of stockholders who could take the losses and never feel them? Much, anyway. Young and self-made and officious, if not efficient, Colborn greeted Pop not at all, but let him stand before the desk a few minutes. You sent for me. I sent for you. Oh yes, I remember now. Pending your retirement, you've been put on the copy desk. My, my what? Your retirement. We are retiring all employees over 50. We need new people and new ideas here. Re retirement? When? How? Effective day after tomorrow. Pop, you are no longer with this newspaper. Our present social security policy... Will pay me off about 20 bucks complete. But to hell with that. I brought this paper into the world and it's going to take me out. You can't do this to me. I'm staying as reporter. All right. You're staying as reporter then. It's only two days. And you're going to give me assignments. All right. Here's an article I clipped a couple months ago. Get a story on it. When Colborn had fished up the magazine out of his rubble-covered desk, he tossed it to Pop like a citizen paying a panhandler. Pop wanted to throw it back, for he saw at a glance that it was merely a stick a rehash of some speech made a long while ago to some physics society. But he had gained ground so far, he wouldn't lose it. He backed out. I'll show him. Call me a has-been. Well, think I can't make a story out of nothing, does he? Why, I'll get such a story that he'll have to keep me on and promote me and raise my pay. He sat down in his chair and scanned the article. It began quite lucidly with the statement that Hannibal Pertwee had made this address before the assembled physicists of the country. Pop tried to wade through said address. All information, even to Pop, was so much polysyllabic nonsense. Something about transportation of freight, some new way to help civilization. But just how, the article did not tell. Pop, at least. Suddenly, Pop felt very old and very tired. At 53, he had 10,000 bylines behind him. He had built the World Journal to its present importance. He loved the paper, and now it was going to hell in the hands of an incompetent. And the only way he had of stopping them was an impossible article by some crack brain on the transportation of freight. Plodding through the dismal dusk of Jersey, he began to wish that he had never heard the name of Hannibal Pertwee. Grimly, if weakly, he had at last arrived at a gate to which a Jerseyite had directed him. Through this factory fence, he could see a house, not much bigger than an architect's model. The fence itself caught his interest. He fingered the steel mesh with wonder. 
at the top of the poles, bent out to support three strands of savage-looking barbed wire, Pop stepped back and was instantly smitten by a sign which shouted, Beware of lions! Area mind! Trespassers buried free of charge! He almost leaped out of his body when a voice before him growled, What is your business? I want to see Hannibal Pertwee. I'm a reporter from the New York World Journal. There was a click, and a square of light glowed in a panel. For seconds, nothing further happened, and then, very slowly, the gate swung inward. Boldly, outwardly at least, Pop marched through. He glared around him, but the strange change in the atmosphere soon registered upon his greedy senses. Here, the walk was only a foot wide, bordered by dwarf plants. What Papa thought to be shrubbery was actually a forest of perfect trees, all less than a yard tall, but with the proportions of giants. Pop approached the house warily, as though it might bite. When he stood upon the porch, stooping a little to miss the roof, the door opened. Standing there was a man not five feet tall, whose face was a study of mildness and apology. His eyes were an indefinite blue, and what remained of his hair was an indefinite gray. He was dressed in a swallowtail coat and striped pants and wing collar, with a tiny diamond horseshoe in his tie. Nervously, he peered at Pop. You are Mr. Bruhauer from the Scientific Investigator? No, I'm from the New York World Journal. Ah. I came to get a story on this lecture you handed out a couple of months ago. Uh, oh, yes, uh, certainly. You must see my garden. I've just seen it. Uh, such wholesome originality and such gigantic trees. Huh? Well, why, over a thousand feet tall, some of them. Of course, trees don't ordinarily grow to a thousand feet. The tallest tree in the world is much less than that. There now, I'm so sorry to walk you all over the place this way, but I have recently given my cars to charity. Hey, wait. We haven't been anywhere. Uh, no, indeed not. My garden is only a small portion of what I have yet to show you. Uh, please, come in. Pop followed him into the house. He casually got out his cigarette case and offered Hannibal a smoke. The little man started to refuse and then noticed the case. Oh, what an unusual design. Yeah. Pop pressed the button. The sidewalks of New York tinkled through the room. Fascinating. What delicate mechanism. You know, I've made several rather small things myself. Here is a car, which I spent much time constructing. The engine is quite perfect. And thereupon, he took the inch-long object and poked into it with a toothpick. There was a resultant purr. It runs! Uh, of course. It should get about a uh, hundred thousand miles to the gallon. Therefore, if a car would make the trip, and if it could carry enough gas, then it could go to the moon. The moon is only 238,857 miles from Earth, you know. Now, I must show you around. I wish to show you my trains. Trains? M Mr. Pertwee, I came about that lecture. A, a lecture? That you made before the Physics Society? Something about moving freight? Oh, uh, the Pertree elucidation of the simplification of transportational facilities as applying to the freight problems of the United States. Uh, you mean that? Yes, that's it. Just some comment or other. I couldn't understand just what it was all about. Uh, there's nothing half so lovely as a train. Pop took out his case and lighted a cigarette. Uh, would, would, would you mind pressing that button again? Once more, the worn mechanism tinkled out its music. When it had done, Hannibal took the case and inspected it anew with great attention. But let's get on to the trains. 
Hannibal bounced eagerly up and led his caller through the house, pausing now and then to show other instances of things done very small. Finally, they reached the train room, and here Pop stopped short in amazement, for here, spread out at their feet, were seemingly miles of track leading off in a bewildering tangle of routes. My trains. Pop just kept staring. There were toy stations and semaphores and miniature rivers and roads and underpasses and sidings and switches. And on the track stood a whole fleet of freight cars in a yard. Engines stood about ready to do the switching. The roundhouses were crammed with rolling stock. And in short, nearly every type of equipment used was represented here. Hannibal was already down on his knees at a switchboard. He grabbed up a top hat and plonked it on his head and then beamed at Pop. Cargo of strawberries for Chicago. He threw half a dozen switches. That bare space way over there is Chicago. Pop saw then that this room was vast enough to contain a replica of the United States and realized with a start that these tracks were, each one, a counterpart of an actual railroad line. This is New York. Yeah, only, of course, there isn't anything there yet. And now, here we go! In the space of two hours, Pop watched freight being shunted all over the United States. Finally, Hannibal brought the cars back to the New York yard and broke up the last train. With a sigh, he took off his hat and stood up, smiling apologetically. You must go now. Look, just give me some kind of an idea of what you were talking about in that article so I can mention it in the paper. Do you understand anything about infinite acceleration? Well, no. Or the fourth dimension? Or Einstein's mathematics? No. Then I don't think I can explain. They wouldn't believe me. So, you see, you wouldn't either. Good night. And Pop presently found himself outside the gate, confronted once more with the long walk to the station and the long ride back to New York. A fine job he'd done. No story. Still, say, those trains would make a swell yarn. A batty little scientist playing with toy railroads? Sure, he'd do it. Play it on the human interest side. But he'd never get far with it. Trudging along, he reached for his cigarette case. He fumbled in other pockets. Alarm began to grow on him. He couldn't find it. More slowly, he repeated the search. Hurriedly then, he tore back to the gate and shouted at the house. But the only reply he got was printed on the sign, Trespassers buried free of charge. Pop it might be said, was just a little proud of having turned out a presentable story where no story had been before. And feeling the need of a little praise, he finished off his story the following morning and took it to Colborne personally. Well, that story you sent me out on, you didn't think there was any story there. And you were right as far as news was concerned. But human interest. Hmm. You call this a story? Go back to the copy desk. And so saying, he dropped the sheets into the wastebasket with an emphatic gesture of dismissal. Pop was a little dazed. He backed out and stood on the sill for seconds before he closed the door. A hurrying reporter jostled him and was about to rush on when he saw Pop's expression. You look like you need a drink. I do. So he's making it tough for you, is he? That dirty rat. Never mind, Pop. When better newsmen are built, they'll look like you. Some, something will break sooner or later. I'm leaving tomorrow. Say, look now. Don't quit under fire. You know what ails that guy? He's scared. That's all. Scared of most of us, and you in particular. Why, hell's bells, you belong in that chair. We're losing money, hundreds a day, and when it gets to thousands, the publisher himself will get wise. I'm being laid off. You? For God's sake. 
He went on cleaning out his desk, looking very worn and old and quiet. He scarcely looked up when Colborn passed him on his way out to lunch. It was about one o'clock, and he was just tying a string about his belongings. The phone rang on the next desk, and Pop, out of habit, reached across for it. Give me rewrite. I'll take it. This is Jensen. I'm up on the drive. Ready? Pop raked some copy paper to him and picked up a pencil. He was a little excited by the legman's tone. Ready. At 12.45 today, Grant's tomb disappeared. Huh? Get it down. The traffic on the drive was at its noon hour peak, and the benches around the structure were filled with people. When without warning, a rumble sounded. The alarmed populace... To hell with the words. Give me the story. How did it I don't. I don't know. Nobody knows. There is a half a dozen police cars around here staring at Grant's tomb. I was about a block away when I heard shrieks and I came tearing down to find the traffic was jammed up and that people were running away from the place while other people ran toward it. I asked a nursemaid about it. and she see, She'd seen it happen. She said there was a rumbling sound and then suddenly the tomb began to shrink in size and in less than 10 seconds, it had vanished. Was anybody seen monkeying with it? A chauffeur said he saw a little guy in a swallowed tail coat tear across the spot where the tomb had been. How many dead? Nobody knows if anybody is dead. Well, find out. How can I find out when everybody that, that was sitting on the steps had all completely disappeared? They're gone. Somebody is crazy. No bodies? No tomb. I got this much. You hoof it back there and get stories from the witnesses. He hung up and whirled to shout down the line of desks. Grant's tomb gone. Get Columbia on the phone. We gotta have a statement from somebody that knows his stuff. You, Sweeney, grab an encyclopedia and see if anything like this ever happened before. Morton, grab a camera and get out there for some pictures. Dunstan, you go with Morton and find the relatives of the people that have vanished along with the tomb. Get going! Nobody thought of tearing out to find Colborn. Sweeney, Morton, Dunstan, and others went into a flurry of activity. Branner, start setting up an extra. We'll be on the street in half an hour. Second extra in an hour and a half with pictures. Is this Pop? Yeah, this is Pop. What are you waiting for? Okay, half an hour it is. Louis, get some shots of Gramps' tomb out of the files and rush them down to composing. Pop pulled his old typewriter toward his stomach and his fingers began to flash over the keys. In five minutes, it was streaming down to composing. Pop got up and paced around his desk. He had pinch hit as night editor so often that he did not question his authority to go ahead. And still, nobody thought of Colborn. Shortly, a damp proof was rushed up. The copy boy hesitated for a moment and then laid it on Pop's desk. Pop looked it over. Okay, let it run. The boy loped away, and Pop, reaching for a cigarette, again missed his case. Instead, he hauled up a limp package and lighted a match. The phone rang somewhere. Who's this? Freeman, grab your pencil. Got it, said Pop beginning to tingle at the tone of the legman. The Empire State Mil Building disappeared about five minutes ago. Right. I'm down at the precinct. About three seconds ago, a cop came staggering in with the news. I haven't had a chance to look. Get right down there and see. Grant's tomb vanished just before you called. Check. Pop put down the phone and dashed over to the window. But in vain, he searched the skyline for any sign of the Empire State Building. Gone. The human being in him was appalled. The newspapermen went into action. Goodert, get a camera down to the Empire State. It's disappeared. Check. Copy boy. Branner, limit the first extra. Get set for a second. Story coming down. The Empire State building has disappeared. Okay. Get some pictures down to Branner on the Empire State. New York is going piece by piece. Call the mayor, somebody. 
Tell him about it and ask him what he means to do. Check. No such incident in the encyclopedia. Unprecedented. Lawson and Frankie, you two get cameras and rush downtown to be on hand in case any other buildings exit. Copy boy. And the second story was on its way to composing, and still nobody remembered Colborn. Pop walked around his desk. Again, he reached for his cigarette case and was again annoyed to find it gone. He lighted up, frowning over new angles, one eye hopefully on the phone. Find out how many people are usually in the Empire State. Check! Certain that the story would keep breathing, Pop was not at all surprised when Frankie called. Pop. Pop, this is Frankie. Pennsylvania Station's gone. Pe full of people? Trains and everything. There's nothing there but a hole in the ground. I was lucky. A, a, about a block away, I saw it happen. You said big, so I figured Pennsylvania. The story. Well... There was a kind of rumble, and then all of a sudden, this station seemed to cave into itself, and it was gone. A little guy in a swallowtail coat almost knocked me over, running away. He was scared to death. Everybody was trying to get away, and right on the corner, one of our boys was shouting out first extra. The whole building just disappeared. That's all. People, trains, everything. You want to see the hole in the ground. Get statements and rush your pictures back here. Don't be a damn photographer all your life. Okay, Pop. Pennsylvania Station. Tim, get this for rewrite. About five minutes ago, Pennsylvania Station disappeared. People, trains, everything. There's nothing but a hole in the ground. There was a rumble. And then the thing vanished. Seemed to cave into itself, but there is no debris. It's gone. All gone. Okay, Pop. Copy boy. Pictures of Pennsylvania Station. Branner, keep adding to that extra. We got pictures coming to Pennsylvania Station. It's gone. Pen. Oh, boy. What a story. Angles. Angles. Got a statement from the mayor. He's yelling sabotage. He says he's phoning the governor to call out the militia. He says they can't do this to his town. Banner for extra number three. Mayor objects. Calls out militia. Story coming down. Roll it out and spread it thick. They'll be half panicked by now. Stab in a human interest angle. Make them take it calm. Jack... Pop walked around his desk and again reached for his cigarette case to again discover that it was missing. Angles. Two men with swallowtail coats. Eddie, take this lead. Mystery man seen in two catastrophes. A small man with a swallowtail coat was present today at both the vanishing of the tomb and Pennsylvania Station. Was seen to run across the place where tomb had been and collided with one of our reporters just after Pennsylvania disappeared. Got it? Check. Pop went over to the window. For some reason, he kept harking back to Hannibal Pertwee. Railway station, cigarette case, swallowtail coat. Freeman came dashing up. She's sure gone. What? The Empire State Building. There's nothing but a hole in the ground. There were umpteen thousand people inside, and there's no sign of them. Okay, do me a story about the state of the city, how calm they're taking it. Smooth them down. Third extra is on its way, and you'll make the lead in the fourth. Pop turned back to his desk. He was so preoccupied that he did not see a dark cloud come thundering through the city room. Callborn, with a copy of the first extra in his hands, bore down upon what was obviously the center of the maelstrom. Did you do this? Sure. What about it? Why didn't you call me? You know where I eat lunch. How do you know this story is true? What do you mean spreading terror all over town? How is it 
that we get a paper out so quick when there's nobody else on the streets. If this is a farce, then we're in Dutch plenty. Civil and criminal actions. It takes guts to run a paper. If that's what it takes, you've got too many. Now, we've got to check everything we've printed. If we've got... If you've got another extra on the rollers, we'll have to kill it and find out if... The third extra is on the street. And you took the authority without even trying to find me? A story has got to go when it's hot. And you ran this one so hot that you're driving New York into a panic. Get out. What? I said get out. You're through. Finished. Washed up. Today instead of tomorrow. And nursing his injured importance, Colborn flung off to his office. Pop stood for a little while and then, with a shrug, picked up the package on his desk. Well, it was fun while it lasted. You're going to take him at his word? Just because you were smart enough not to wait? He's just sore because you did it so swell. Maybe. You're going to quit like this? No, not like this. Well, wh what you going to do? Pop hefted his package. He looked grim. At dusk, Pop approached the fortress of Hannibal Pertwee. At a garage, he had managed to separate himself from five dollars he could ill afford, an electrician from a pair of insulated gloves, and the heaviest pair of wire cutters he could carry. Breaking and entering would be a very serious offense, but he was first going to give Hannibal a chance. For several minutes, he waited dutifully at the gate, hoping that the mysterious voice would again speak, but this time it did not, and the house remained as dark as it was small. Yeah, you asked for it. Very painstakingly, he inspected the latch. Then he donned the rubber gloves and took the cutters and went to work. In a few minutes, the gate was swinging open, leaving its latch behind. Oh, if this hunch he had was wrong. Hannibal opened the door and gazed sadly at him. It will be so much work to repair that gate. Well, um, you see... Well, I, I am very sorry, but I can't ask you in tonight. I am so busy. I, uh, I came after my cigarette case. C cigarette case? Yes. I lost it when I was here before. I would dislike having to part with it permanently. You don't mind if I come in and look, do you? Well, uh... uh oh. But Pop was already shouldering past Hannibal Pertwee, and the little man could not but give way. However, Hannibal skipped to the fore and guided Pop into the minute living room. I was sitting here in this chair. Hannibal fidgeted. You don't mind if I look elsewhere. Oh, yes. I, I mean, no. I am very busy. R really, you have to go. But my cigarette case is very valuable to me. Uh, of course, of course. Um, I appreciate your predicament. But if I had seen it, and if I find it... Oh, dear. What am I saying? Well, I won't trouble you any further. I can see how upset you are. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Pertwee. <laughs> Eagerly, Hannibal grasped the offered hand. Swiftly, Pop yanked Hannibal close to him and gave an expert frisk. <laughs> the cigarette case leaped out of Hannibal's pocket. Pop looked at it with satisfaction. I wonder how that got there. <laughs> so do I. And now, if I could inspect your trains again. Well, yes. All right, um, just come this way. And he stepped through the door. Pop was so close behind him that he almost got cut in half when the door slammed shut. There was the rumble of a shot bolt, and Pop's weight against the door had no effect at all. He swore and dashed for the hall. Another door slammed there. Pop stood glaring through the walls at Hannibal. Then he got another idea and rushed outside to take a tour of the house. But there was nothing to be seen. Pop had to be content with his victory in recovering his case. He went off up the road in the direction of the station. Grumbling to himself, he stood on the platform waiting for a train to carry him back to New York. 
he could swear that there was some connection between the forest, the miniature car, the trains, and the vanished buildings. Pop took out his cigarette case. It still contained several cigarettes, so evidently Hannibal did not smoke. Pop lit up. He was about to replace the case when he wondered if any harm had come to it. He pressed the music button. No sound came forth. Damn him. Broke it. Well, he could have it fixed. Hannibal the loon had probably worn it out. About eight, he wandered out of the station to straggle haphazardly uptown. He was trying to tell himself that he was glad he was through. No more chasing fire engines for him. What a hell of a life it was. Never any regular sleep, always on the go, living from story to story. Well, now he could settle down and rest a while. Shuffling along, head down, hands deep in his jacket pockets, he coursed his way to 8th Avenue. A saloon was nearby, and he wandered into it to place a foot on the rail. Right. Straight. The British-looking barkeep pushed out a glass and filled it with an expert twist of his wrist. Pop downed the drink and stood there for a while, staring morosely at his reflection in the mirror behind the pyramided wares. Fill it up. Ain't that awful about them buildings and all? The wickedness of the city is what brought it on. Just yesterday I says to a gent in here, I says, a town as simple as this. Pop took out his cigarette case. Yeah. A town as simple as this cannot meet the one fate in the mighty wrath. <laughs> Pop was jarred out of his wits. The whole bar had vanished. The whole bar complete with tender. The mirrors were still there, but that was all. Pop's news-keen mind examined all the possibilities in sight. Was it possible that someone had come in that door and done this? Had Hannibal followed him? He looked at the floor where the planks were patterned as the bar had stood. And then Pop received another shock. There was the bar, about an inch long, almost lost in a crack between the flooring. Hastily, he picked it up, afraid of hurting it. He could barely make out the bartender, who did not seem to be moving. Pop put the thing in a small cardboard box he found in the refuse and then stowed it carefully in his pocket. This opened up a wide range of thought, and he needed air in which to think. He went out into the street. This bar had dwindled in size. Was it not possible then that the buildings had done likewise? And if they had... Mightn't they still be there? He mulled this for a long time, standing at the curb. Taxi! Pop took out his case and started to extract a cigarette. Tex! And the cab folded into itself with such rapidity that Pop's eye could not follow. Pop trembled. He shut his eyes and counted to ten. When he opened them, the cab was still gone. Then he looked more closely at the pavement and stooped down. Here was the cab, a little less than an inch long and proportionate in the other two dimensions. Pop put it in his cardboard box. He surreptitiously inspected the case by the faint glow of a shop window. But there, but there wasn't anything unusual about it. Pop looked around and found a trash can. If this case was doing it, it certainly could make this trash can dwindle. Pop pushed the opening button. Nothing happened. He breathed a sigh of relief. Somebody was following him. That was it. Sure, that was the answer. Pop, feeling better, he took his stand on the corner near a large apartment house. When the other person came near, he would take out his case and then, bow, grab the malefactor and drag him back to the paper for interview. In a few minutes, a fellow in very somber clothes came near. Pop took out his cigarette case and started to open it. And the apartment building was gone. Pop was shaken up by the vibration of its going, but he did not lose his presence of mind. He snatched the bystander and bore him to earth. The full light of the street lamp shone down. He had captured a minister of the gospel. Very swiftly, Pop got away from there. By a circuitous route, Pop came back to the hole. He found the tiny thing which had been a building. 
It looked like a perfect model, about five inches high. There was a sting to the object, which was very uncomfortable. All Pop's fine ideas had gone glimmering now. It was the case. It had to be. And to test it out, he had probably slain hundreds, maybe thousands of people. But his news sense was soon uppermost again. The night editor's voice boomed over the wire. Joe, this is Pop. Look, I've got a bar, one taxi, and an apartment building in my pocket. Stand by for an extra about midnight. You? Huh? Ah. <laughs> Sleep it off, Pop, and drink one for me. <laughs> no, 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 no. But the wire was dead. So they wouldn't believe him, huh? Well, he'd show him. He'd show him. I won't. They sat in Colborne's office and the clock said 10. Colborne had yet come, not yet come in. Hannibal Pertwee showed signs of having mauled a bit. And even now he tried to make a break for the door. Pop tripped him and set him back on the chair. It's no use. I won't tell you or anybody else. After what they did to me, why should I do anything for them? In the center of the room sat a gunny sack. Carefully wrapped up within it were some items Pop had found occupying the vacant spaces in the vicinity of New York on Hannibal Pertwee's toy railway system. I'll have you for burglary. You can't prove anything at all. What if I do have some models of buildings? Can't I make models of what I please? What about those people you can see in them? Can't I make people in model form, too? Pop was alternating warm and chill, for he knew he was dabbling in very serious matters. Anxiously, he looked at the clock, as though by that signal, Colborne came in. What? You here again? That's right. And I have... There is no use begging for that job. We don't need anybody. Get out or I'll have you thrown out. And he reached across the desk for his phone. Pop's handy feet sent Colborne sprawling. Pop instead pushed the button. Send in Mr. Graw. I'll blacklist you. You'll never work for another paper. I'll take my chances. Mr. Graw, the very portly publisher, stepped in. He saw Pop and scowled. Colborne was dusting off his pants in protest. What's this? He won't get out. I, he sent for you. I didn't. Well, of the cheek. Now listen, you two. I've been in this business a long time, and I know what a story is. You're losing money, and you need circulation. Well, the way to get circulation is to get stories. Now. Hey, whoa. <laughs> On the table, Pop laid out the four objects from the gunny sack. The Pennsylvania Station, Grand Central, Grant's Tomb, and the Empire State. Then from his jacket, he took the bar, the taxi, and the apartment house. I will Attempting another break. Once more, Pop pushed him back to the chair. What are these? Just what you see. The missing buildings. Preposterous. If you have gone all, to all this trouble just to make some foolish story. I've gone to plenty of trouble, but not to have anything made. These are the real thing. Rot. Well, I'll make you a proposition. If I restore these to their proper places, can I have my job back permanently? Huh. If you pu can put back this, what the city has lost, I'll give you your job back, yes. But why waste our time? Then call Mr. Barstow of the Pennsylvania Railroad. You get him over here on the double, and I'll put the buildings back. But how? Just call. That's all. You can't afford to run the risk of losing this chance. If you're talking nonsense. But he put through the call. It was an uncomfortable wait while Hannibal protested at intervals and Colborne rubbed his hands. But at last, Mr. Barstow, in a sweat, came loping in. You called me, Mr. Graw. By God, I hope there's news. Graw pointed at Pop. This idiot claims to have your station. He says this is it. 
Barstow snatched up the model of Pennsylvania, it stung his hands and he put it back. He turned to Pop. Is this a joke? That's a perfect replica, certainly, but... Look, this is Hannibal Pertwee, probably the smartest scientist since Moses. Oh, you. So you know him. He used to bother us quite a bit. What is it now? Ah, we get somewhere. Barstow, if this gentleman replaces your Pennsylvania station and these other objects, will you make a contract with him? About his crazy ideas on freight? I don't know which is the cra craziest statement, that you'll restore the buildings or that anything he can think of will affect our freight. But go ahead. Pop yanked out a slip of paper. I type this. Sign it. Smiling indulgently, Barstow signed the agreement. Graw and Colborne shrugged and witnessed it with their names. All right. This is what you used to be begging for. You've got it now. Go ahead. And indeed, Hannibal Pertwee had undergone a change. All trace of sullenness was gone from his face, replaced by growing hope. You mean that you really consider my propositions? That you may utilize my findings? I've said so in this paper. Well, you see, gentlemen, <clears throat> my idea was to reduce freight in size so that it could be shipped easily. And so I analyzed the possibilities of infinite acceleration. Bear the lecture. Get busy. They won't understand anything but action. Ah, uh, yes, action. Um, may I have this cigarette case? Pop handed it over. Hannibal caressed the case. It was very ingenious, I thought. Uh, I had been waiting for this very thing. Apparatus would have been unnoticed, you see, but uh, this was perfect. One can stand on the edge of a crowd and press the buttons, uh, both together, and the atomic bubble within is set into nearly infinite acceleration. It spits out and engulfs the first whole object it embraces and sets it spinning in four dimensions. Of course, as the object spins at a certain speed, it is accordingly reduced in size. Um, Einstein... Just push the buttons. Uh, ha Hannibal turned the case around so that it would open down. He pointed it in the general direction of the tiny taxi. It compresses time as well as space. I just release the bubble. <laughs> the taxi increased in size like a swiftly inflated balloon. The tick tick of its engine was loud in the room. The cabbie finished opening the door and then turned to where he had last seen Pop. What a dress, buddy! And then he saw his surroundings. He stared, gulped, looked at the ring of reporters and office men, and hastily shut off his engine, shaking his head as though punch drunk. Cabbie, you step back here out of the way. Do your stuff, Hannibal. <laughs> and the taxi was toy-sized instantly. The cabbie began to wail a protest, but Pop shoved the tiny car into his hands. We'll make it grow up shortly, down in the street. Frankie, you and Lawson get some cameras. Freeman, you call the mayor and tell him to gather round for the fun. Sweeney, you write up an extra lead, telling the city all is well. I'll knock out the story on this. Oh, no, you won't, said Graw. Huh? But you said in front of witnesses. I don't care what I said. I've suddenly got an idea. Who got out those extras so fast yesterday? Bob did. Graw turned to Colborn. At first, I believed you, Colborn. When I got to thinking it over after I found out how fast they really had come. He didn't mean nothing by it. He's just a little young. Pop, you can't have his job. Well, I didn't say... Pop, I've got a better spot for you than that. You're managing editor. Maybe you can make his, this son-in-law of mine amount to something if you train him right. Ma m managing editor? 
I'm going to slip out a job. I need a rest. And so, Mr. Managing Editor, I'll leave you to your additions. The roof-raising cheer, which went up from a half a hundred throats. Well, what are you waiting for? We got an extra addition to get out, and that means work. Hannibal, you trot along with Frankie and Lawson. They'll help you put them buildings back. And listen, Frankie, don't miss any shots. Pop took up the package he had left at the switchboard. He went into the office marked Managing Editor and laid his belongings on the desk. He shed his coat, rolled up his sleeves, and reached for the phone. Copy, boy! Okay, Pop, 